chapter 4, verse 4, it's a brief uh, 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 um, scripture, brief verse. Um, it comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians. If you remember when we looked at the letters, when we did that series on the letters, Galatians was not written to one particular church the way that Romans was or Corinthians was or Thessalonians was, but Galatians was actually kind of written to a region. And so the purpose and the, the tone, the style of, of that particular letter was Paul knew he was writing to a larger, broader audience, um, that the letter was meant to be shared and passed around several churches in the region of Galatia, Galatia, and and so what we have here is a is is pastoral teaching, not to a church, not to a single church, but to a, a collection, to a church network. Galatians chapter four, verse four. But when the fullness of the time had come, this is the English Standard Version. That's the translation that we're using. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law underline highlight, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoptions as sons. This is the church and the state. And this might, you know, we, we may do a two-parter here. We'll, we'll see what we get through there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history, a lot of teaching in this word, but important, important information. Um, so, so, so what do we need to understand? We need to understand that the world Jesus entered, our world, and, and, and versus um, and, 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 and versus the world where Jesus comes from. So there's the environment, there's the existence, there's the dimension from which Jesus comes, and there's the environment, there's the world, there's the dimension that Jesus enters in, which is ours. So in order for Christ to have come, Christ had to, there, some things had to happen first. In order for us to come to Christ, in order for us to come to Christ, Christ first had to come to us. So for early readers, the gospel accounts, and remember that, that it's not so much the gospel according to, because it's not Matthew's gospel, it's not Mark's, Luke's, John's gospels. There aren't four different gospels. There's one gospel. There's one message. There's one uh, a, a teaching. The gospel of Jesus Christ recorded, witnessed, as seen through these four authors that, that either were direct witnesses themselves, Matthew and John, were there, lived with Jesus, traveled with Jesus, heard Jesus teach, saw the miracles, performed some miracles themselves as commissioned by Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, or it's, a, it's an account of a collection of firsthand witnesses and other individuals that were there with Jesus there at the time, and that's where you have Mark John, Mark, and Luke, Luke, the physician. Um, Luke relies heavily on Peter's firsthand account, Peter's witness. You get a lot of text from Luke as through Peter's perspective. And then with John, Mark, it's a collection, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of Peter as you uh, uh, and, and others uh, who were there and with Jesus and traveled with Jesus. So early readers of the gospel accounts were familiar with, with the world into which Jesus came. They were aware of Roman occupation. They were aware of the cultural historical context because for them it was real time. It's different for you and I. Without the benefit of, of studying history, without the benefit of reading texts, you and I can't fully appreciate the world into which Jesus came. Um, and and so the, the land, the region, into which Jesus was born is, is, is Palestine, is, is kind of modern day, we call matter, modern day Palestine. There was a natural scenery, and it was the same as when Abraham pitched his tent in Shechem. So there wasn't, even though 
thousands of years had passed between the time of Abraham and the time of Jesus, the, the region, the area was largely the same. There were, there were some advancements in technology, some construction, you know, some roads started to be built, towns were popping up. There was a bit more by way of infrastructure in terms of kind of aqueducts and plumbing and, and those sorts of things. But when you think about, and this is powerful for us to get family, when you think about a couple thousand years of development between Abraham and Jesus, and then a couple thousand years between Jesus and today, we're talking about, I mean, like different worlds of existence. We, we've said this before. You've heard me use this before, that if you were to take someone that lived at the time of Christ and not even bring them to the U.S., if you were to take someone that lived at the time of Christ and just bring them forward into today's time, in the same location. Forget about bringing them from, you know, from from Jerusalem to to uh, Connecticut. But if you were just to bring someone um, that lived at the time of Jesus forward a couple thousand years, so that they were in Jerusalem in the modern time, they would they would largely believe, or they might come to the conclusion or or the they might have the experience of being on a different planet now it, you know seeing the fact that that while humans were are like wearing different things but that we were still humans you know two eyes two ears that that whole bit so that might ground them in the fact that okay i'm not i'm not somewhere completely different but they would not recognize where they were in the same way that um, if you were to bring someone that lived at the time of Moses, you know, some of uh, someone from the 12 tribes that followed and traveled with Moses, and if you were to bring them forward a couple thousand years to the time of Jesus, again, it would be different, but it wouldn't be drastically different in the same way that that at the time of Jesus to now. Now, wh why why am I going through all that? Why am I why am I bothering to to painfully <laughs> make this point? Because in order for us to appreciate the message that Jesus shared when he came and the world in which Jesus entered and the world in which we live and the message that 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 Christ had then and and trying to bring that message forward, we have to appreciate that yes, what Jesus said for them is for us, but it doesn't apply the same way in that there have been significant changes and Christ was trying to, to lay a foundation that would prepare the modern church for the modern world in which we live. Now, not exclusively because each generation that reads the scripture, for them, it's the modern church, right? So, so uh, you know, in the third century AD, 300 years after Christ died, that was the modern church when they read it. And it was a different experience than when Christ lived. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the 11th century AD, a thousand years after Christ is born and lived and dies. For them, it was the modern church. And for you and I to think about, uh, you know, a, a, a thousand AD, 1100 AD, that that's that's still, it's it, for us, it's ancient history. It's hard for us to conceive of a time where there isn't electricity, where there isn't indoor plumbing, uh, where, where there aren't uh, roads and and bridges and uh, motorized transportation and none of that existed even a thousand years after Jesus. So we have to be able to just contextualize family. We have to 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 offer a framework. So the period during which most of the changes occurred were the years between the Old and New Testament. And, and much of that time is considered the silent period. 
So some of the changes from the Old Testament into the New Testament included the development of the synagogue as a key feature in religious gathering and teaching. Moses didn't have a synagogue. Joshua didn't have a synagogue. The judges uh, didn't have synagogues. G uh, David, King David, uh, uh, Solomon, all the Ahab, all the kings that followed, the synagogue was a newer development. It was, they were small schools. Essentially, they were small schools. They were training institutes where men would go and 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 learn the Torah and memorize the Torah and receive instruction. There were the development of various religious sects. The Pharisees and Sadducees are the two big ones that we know. We know that they are incredibly influential during Jesus's time. Jesus addresses both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and so they had great influence. And it's important to, to appreciate these, these features of society, <clears throat> excuse me, because the development of these features were influenced by the, 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 the larger cultural government influence that was being exerted on Israel from outsiders that impact the environment in which Christ arises. I Listen, I know y'all want me to preach, but I got to teach this thing. I, I need us to get this foundation. I need us to have this understanding of the cultural historical context. Let's go back. Let's go back a bit to Daniel's vision. You can read Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter seven. And remember that Daniel has a vision. Daniel has a dream where he sees a statue and, and it's, you know, a gold head and, and um, a bronze uh, torso and, and uh, uh, the feet are iron and, uh, or the legs are iron and the feet are a combination of iron and clay and this this boulder, this stone, this rock rolls down a hill and smashes the statue. And and through study and and interpretation, we taught and we've talked about this a bit as well. That the different materials and the different parts of the statue represent these different kingdoms. I want to skip ahead in my notes a bit, but this is important. So there was the Babylonians and that, you know, that that's the gold, that's the head, that's Nebuchadnezzar. And so the Babylonians were really the first outside empire that took complete control over, uh, uh, over Israel, over all of, of Israel and Judah. They come in, the Babylonians come in and, and remember I, I know this is a lot of history, but this is recorded. So you 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 can go back and and I appreciate you, Miss Queen. I see you in the chat showing me some love. So I appreciate you. You, you can go back and and, and rewatch the video. Uh, but remember that that it, Israel, for for lack of a better term, rejects God as their king, rejects God as their leader. Israel petitions Samuel the prophet to say, give us a king, anoint us a king. And, and the first king is Saul. And I actually, I was doing my devotional during the weekend and God gave me a message that I'll preach in a couple of weeks on Saul and the lessons of leadership that we can take from Saul. Even as, as wicked and as, as backwards as Saul was, there's some real lessons in leadership that we get from Saul. And so you have Saul and then you have David and then you have Solomon and, and you go on through this period in Israel's history under the leadership of the kings. And it's because, watch this, because Israel chooses to adopt a government. We're talking about the church and the state here. Because Israel chooses to adopt a government centered in humanity. Israel rejects a government centered in God. That's the Mosaic law. That's the, 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 the government 
where the tabernacle is at the center, the literal center of the gathering of Israel. As Israel is marching through the wilderness, as Israel is claiming the promised land, the center of of their civilization, the center of their government, the center of their existence is the tabernacle. And in the center of the tabernacle, in the heart of the heart, in the middle, the eye in the eye, the wheel, as Ezekiel describes it, the wheel, inside the wheel is the holy of holies. It's the spirit of the living God. God establishes his kingdom, his government, his society, where God is in the center and Israel rejects the formation of God. Israel rejects the, the government, the society that God is establishing to develop and literally removes God from the center and places a man places a human being and says, give us a king to rule over of us, rule over us like all the other nations. Um, somebody say, help us, Jesus. Uh, help us, Holy Ghost. Uh, Israel literally rejects uh, the government that God has formulated by removing God from the center and inserting a human being, inserting a king, and that's the domino. It's the beginning of the descent. It's the beginning of the downfall. It's the beginning of the destruction of the nation of Israel because Israel has replaced God with a human being. Help us, Holy Ghost. And so you have then from the kings the end of the dispensation, the end of the period of kings with the invasion of Jerusalem by Babylon. Babylon becomes the first of a series of foreign nations, foreign invaders that invade Jerusalem, that take over and impose their will, their culture, their government upon the people of God. So from Babylon, you go to the, to the Medes and the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire. Cyrus and, 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 and Darius uh, 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 were the, the, under the, the Medo-Persian Empire. From the Medes and the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire, the next major empire to invade and, and to take over the region and, and, and really large portions of the, of the world, of the globe, you have the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great. And, and with Alexander the Great, you get significant technological innovations like roads and bridges. bridges. Alexander brings, as, as part of his ability to conquer so much, Alexander is able to conquer as much of the world that he is able to conquer is because of significant innovations in infrastructure where supplies can now move much quicker. Supplies can be moved more efficiently. So, so, so there's protection during uh, 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 difficult seasons where Alexander doesn't have to halt a war campaign because of winter. With the development of roads and bridges, Alexander can bring supplies to the battlefront to support soldiers while they're waging these long siege campaigns to take over these, these tribes and these regions and these areas. They don't just have to wait for winter to come to an end, they can be constantly resupplied. And as they take over a new area, they expand their supply routes, they expand their trade routes so that they can continue to grow and expand their empire. And so you get the Grecian Empire uh, uh, under the leadership of Alexander the Great. And then ultimately, what, what brings us to the time of Jesus is the Roman Empire and Julius Caesar is the first to kick off. And essentially the Roman Empire um, fills the power vacuum that's left at the time of Alexander's death. And the Roman Empire um, essentially takes over the footprint 
of the Grecian Empire and expands on it, increases it, grows it. And, and so the, the Roman Empire becomes then the last major foreign empire to invade Jerusalem. And, and, and at the collapse of the Roman Empire, then you start to get now more um, what, what closely resembles kind of modern society. So there's, there's the colonial powers of, of Europe. You've got um, the British Empire, but the British Empire never didn't make it as far west to colonize the uh, or or as uh, yeah I mean you know as you think about as far east to colonize uh, Jerusalem and Syria and and Palestine and that you know what we kind of refer to as the Middle East the British Empire didn't colonize that area um, it certainly uh, it, it, it uh, influenced um, it certainly had an impact but in terms of uh, colonial reign the way that you saw British and Spanish and French colonies in the continent of Africa, British and, and, and French um, uh, and, and Spanish colonies throughout the Caribbean and the West Indies and then, you know, into North and, and South America, very different. You don't see that same kind of colonial government and colonial society the way that you do. You don't see that in the Middle East the way that you do and some of these other areas. And so the Roman Empire becomes the last major empire to rule in Jerusalem and to have an impact on the society and the government of God's people. So these foreign agents, these foreign invaders, these foreign civilizations have impact and influence over the government, over the society of God's chosen people, Israel. And, and some of the effects that we see are things like the synagogues. You, you, you see more influence and you see more power uh, being demonstrated and exercised through the synagogues than you do the temple. And this is so important that we get this family because what the synagogues rep represent, the synagogues represent a decentralization. They represent individuals pulling off and pulling away pieces of God's authority. The temple is not the most central, or the, um, excuse me, the temple is not the most significant source of influence and power in Israel, even if it is central. And so much of, 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 of communal worship still happens at the temple. You still have to bring your sacrifices to the temple. The high priest is still administering the Passover sacrifice at the temple. Uh, 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 Israel from uh, uh, from across their diaspora, uh, uh, where they went into exile and 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 spread abroad to places like Egypt and and throughout the region. Uh, when Israel, when 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 um, uh, Jewish people have their high holy days, they're still returning to Israel. They're still returning to Jerusalem, rather. They're still returning to the temple to make these celebrations. So there is a fabric of the culture that is still maintaining the sanctity and the significance of the temple. But what's happening in terms of influence, in terms of power, is you see pieces being stripped off because all of the teaching doesn't happen at the temple anymore. All of the discipleship doesn't happen at the temple anymore. It's happening in these synagogues. It's happening in these uh, uh, smaller teaching institutes. And what happens then is you have uh, these sects, you have these groups that start to pop up and they align based on charismatic leadership. They align based on the influence and the teaching of these individuals. Somebody say, help us, Holy Ghost. So, 
And so you have these rabbis now that are establishing the power of personality. You have these rabbis now that are peeking off and, and pulling off and siphoning off power and pieces of God's influence because of the way that they interpret scripture. And, you, and so you have now rabbis and you have sects that are following a rabbi bots because rabbi bots receive uh, uh, views and reads uh, 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 the Torah this way and has this interpretation of the Torah. And you have a, a, a rabbi Nelson uh, uh, that has this interpretation and this reading of the Torah. And you have a, a rabbi Rachel that has this interpretation and this reading of the temple. And so now you have power that is not centralized with the temple and centralized with God, but you have power now being stripped and pulled away and, and siphoned off by individuals that are saying, I have the answer. I have the true way. I have the truth. You should follow me. You should become a part of me. You should line up with what I'm doing. And this is the world in which Jesus enters, where there's all this power of personality and all this division. And Jesus enters this world where the government of God has been stripped away. The power and the significance of the temple has been stripped away. The holiness of the temple has been polluted and diluted. Remember the one time we see Jesus truly lose his temper and act in righteous indignation is when he drives out the money changers because they've turned, as Jesus said, the house of his father into a den of thieves. The temple has just become a place. There isn't the level of honor and sanctity associated with the temple as it was. And so Jesus is entering the world. Jesus is entering God's people. Jesus is entering God's place at a time where God has been removed and is no longer central, but people are using God and using God's words to claim power for themselves. Which is why I say to you, uh, not much has changed in 2,000 years. Uh, we still have preachers uh, trying to pull power to themselves uh, based on their reading of the scripture. Uh, we still have preachers and churches uh, that are trying to consolidate power uh, by minimizing and marginalizing groups of people uh, and saying these people are so wrong. These people are full of sin. They don't have any piece of the kingdom. But if you want a piece of the kingdom, come to my church. Follow my ministry. Follow my teaching. I have the keys of the kingdom. The devil is a liar. No man has the keys to the kingdom. That word was given by revelation and authority from Jesus to Peter. And Peter said, men and brothers, Repent and be baptized. These are the keys to the kingdom. Have a change of heart. Change your minds. Change your wicked ways. Repent. Turn around. Turn from a life focused on yourself and turn to a life focused on Jesus. Be baptized. Be buried under the name of Jesus. Die to your old self. Die to your former ways. Accept the truth of the reality that Jesus is the Son of God who died to remove your sin stain so that you might stand in the presence of the Almighty holy God, and you will receive, you shall receive the greatest gift that could ever be given, the gift of the Holy Spirit. These are the keys of the kingdom. This is what God gave to humanity, and it doesn't belong to any one man or woman. It doesn't belong to any one teaching or any one sect. It belongs to all the world. All you have to do is accept Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The church and the state. And so because Israel and humanity has allowed God 
to be decentralized and God to be marginalized and God to be removed from the core of civilization. You now have the state that stands in opposition to God when it had always been God's purpose for the state to exist under the authority of God. See, we, we live in a world now where the government says that, uh, that the church and the state are supposed to be separate. We live in a world now where, where, where elected officials can write into law God out of the school system, can write into law God out of the government buildings, can write into law that God has no place in our government. This is the world in which we live, where students are no longer allowed to pray aloud together in school because we're writing God out of the government. Now you may say, well, brother pastor, that's, that's not a bad thing because in a, in a free country, in a free world, uh, uh, we could be writing laws that, 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 that espouse and celebrate, uh, 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 that embrace teachings from prophets other than Jesus, uh, that, that, that in a free world, in a free country, if we uh, allow prayer into the schools, uh, then we have to allow all the praying into the school. And what I'm telling you, family of God, is it was never God's intention to share his people's hearts with anything else or anyone else, that it was always God's plan to fill our hearts with himself. But we have removed God from our hearts because we've removed God from our societies. And so now we are left in a place and a time where any theology or any philosophy it has to be viewed and espoused and respected because we've said the one true God is not in fact the one true God. Because we We've created society and civilization where we've pulled God out of the center and we've decided what is God and what is not God. We've decided what is true and what is false. We've decided that God is okay in this context, in this situation, but in all these others, we don't need him. We have pulled God out of the state. We have pulled the church out of the state, but it was not so in the beginning. In the beginning, God created humanity, his most prized possession, God's most blessed creation. And God created humanity and God created humanity and placed humanity in the garden and said, be fruitful and multiply, and reign and rule, establish government in my name, in my creation. And I will rule with you. I will partner with you. God has always wanted to partner with humanity. God has always wanted to reign and rule with humanity. God has always wanted to collaborate in building society, in building civilization, in building government with humanity. It had always been God's plan and design and intention to be at the center of humanity. And we decided it wasn't enough. We decided that we knew better than God. We did that. We did that. And so today we have a world of our own making. And in that regard, I guess, for, for those that, 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 that uh, espouse the ideology that want to believe the, 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 the teaching, the thought process that, that we are God, in that regard, sure, I guess that you can say that, in that we created this world. The world that we have today, we created it by deciding that we didn't need God at the center, by deciding that we didn't need God at the heart of our civilization, that we could do 
better. And so Jesus enters a world. Jesus brings a message of salvation to a world that has, in effect, taken God out of the center and replaced it with a model and a design where we can all have power and authority, where anyone can speak for God, can speak on behalf of God. And as we look around our world today, it's not much different. Yes, from an infrastructure, from a technological perspective, I stand by the statement that I opened this word with, that if you were to take a resident and inhabitant of Jerusalem and bring them forward to Jerusalem in, in 2024, other than the human beings, they they might believe that they are on a different planet. To, to, to see uh, asphalt roads, to see uh, cars, uh, the, the, the internet, the, the, the smartphone, to, 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 to see and hear someone speak through a screen. Unheard of. And it, 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 it unimaginable, unimaginable. And yet, and yet, infrastructure and all that aside, when you get down to it, we're doing many of the same things. We're making many of the same mistakes because we have pulled God out of the state. We have embraced a society, we've embraced a civilization where it's not the church and the state. It's the church or it's the state and then the church. Family of God, I am so grateful that you continue to partner with me. I'm so grateful that you continue to be a part of this work in this ministry and 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 what we are trying to build here what we are are striving to build and develop here i'm grateful that you share these words that you share these clips that you continue to help us to spread the good news of jesus presented through the the work and the teachings of of my connected church if you are joining us for the first time and maybe you're not here with us live february 4th or uh oh yeah february 4th um but you're 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 watching at an, another point in time but something resonated something connected with you the idea that 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 god is not core is not central in your life the idea that that the keys to the kingdom the idea of of living for yourself instead of living for god that that resonates, that's something you can relate to. And you, and you want to do things differently. You want to experience life with God at the center. You want to experience life where, where God is in the heart of you and, and, and living with you and you are living for God. How do you do that? How, how, do, you, how do you make that step? You pray, you pray, you talk to God and you ask God to send the spirit of his son, Jesus, into your heart. And by doing that, you acknowledge and accept first that there is a God and that that God came to earth in the form of a human son, a, a human male, Jesus, born of a virgin, to live a, a life without error, without mistake, so that Jesus could be a sacrifice to correct the mistake you and I have made and, and the legacy of mistake that you and I inherited in living for ourselves instead of living for God. And so if you're ready to take that step today, I want you to pray with me. You can repeat after me. You can let me pray and then you can pray in your own words, but you're going to pray this. 
God, I thank you that you are real and you love me. I need your mercy to forgive me for living life according to my rules and standards. I'm ready to live life according to your standard, a standard of loving you first and loving others as we love ourselves. Thank you, Jesus, for your perfect life. Thank you for giving your life for me. Jesus, come into my heart, live in my mind so that I can live every day from now forward according to the standards and the purpose that God has for me. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, then we believe that God has moved and that God is, is, is blessing you and that this is the beginning of the next phase in your life. We celebrate, we say hallelujah and thank you, Jesus, because the scripture tells us that heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. If we can partner with you, if we can pray with you, if we can, can help you along the way, continue to engage in our content, subscribe to our YouTube channel, visit our website, myconnectedchurch.com, fill out an information card, let us know how we can pray with you, how we can support you. If you would love to partner with us financially, there's a giving link on our website as well, where you can be a blessing to this ministry, and we would appreciate that. We'll be back. Uh, uh, the Lord say the same uh, this week for the midweek recharge and Bible study. Until we connect again, until we meet again, family, stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay in this fight for your faith. God bless your family. We love you.